All right, everyone, we're back with another prospect watch. We didn't really care to do it the week before because last week's card just had so many people to watch out for that weren't really considered prospects at the end of the day. I really enjoyed that card for those reasons. And, you know, last month was actually crazy. We kind of lost the option to see some of our prospects in action. We're going to get to see them again this month. So get ready for that. That's going to be coming up in a little bit here. As always, if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and hit that button, hit the bell to get some notifications and throw me that like, would really appreciate it. So once again, for the month of May, we got a top 10 prospects list coming in from Jeremy out in uh, MMA Suck in Vancouver. And, you know, I'm actually really excited for this list, despite having a couple guys I've already talked about probably far too much, as you can tell by the Pennsylvania hat. I don't have a, Pit I don't have a uh, Philly hat, but I got a Pittsburgh hat. That's from a boy who we'll talk about later. I don't think I've talked about any other fighter more in the last two months. So might as well just wear it proudly right so i mean coming in at number 10 right away we got danielle wolf now unfortunately she did pull out of that fight uh early in may and she's going to be replaced by norman dumont but you know, this is another great boxer in the U.S. that's actually making the transition to MMA. And funny enough, doesn't it seem like the ladies are more willing to transfer over from boxing to MMA? I mean, it's kind of funny to see that, but all the power to them. Clarice Shields is going to be debuting in PFL next month. And, you know, it's going to be really exciting to see Danielle come into the uh, UFC and just really see if she can kind of put together the similar performance she did on the Dana White Contender Series. The most surprising thing about that fight was knowing her history. I mean, she's a three-time national boxing champion. I think it's from 2013 to 2015. She actually also won the 2014 National Golden Gloves as a welterweight. So little accolades like that that make you really understand how good of a boxer she is. And, and I think she showed that on the Dana White Contender Series, right? It, it, there was even some commentary there that suggested, like, if you're going into this fight in terms of game plan, even if you did want to stand there and bang a little bit to maybe test yourself, it's kind of surprising not to see that fight go anywhere else but boxing range you know it was really a curious performance by the opponent but i think that it made danielle wolf stand out even more and so in this case you know unfortunately we won't get to see her fight because she pulled out but we felt it necessary to keep her on the list because she's most certainly a female fighter to you know keep an eye out for and i, I think with the you know only a couple cards left this month i think that's going to be really fun to see some of these other fighters come out but you know keep an eye on her because whenever she gets that next fight book i think she's be absolute fire and you know i think they're going to give her a fight which they've done recently that kind of favors her in terms of the boxing like i don't think they're going to throw her uh you know a perennial bjj champion brazil Jiu -Jitsu black belt type of fighter but we'll see how that one goes very excited for it and number nine, you know, I've actually really enjoyed watching his come up so far. You know, the Jalen Turner fight for Joshua Kalibau is, is an interesting one because, you know, I think he got finished in the second, but at the same time, that's a tall order uh, in terms of uh, your your fights in the UFC, especially at an early, uh, you know, 8 0. But like I said, Jalen Turner's on the come up. I think that he also has had some, some roadblocks to face as he sees a, a step up in competition. But Kali Bao was in the same boat, right? And I think he adjusted very well. One of my, you know, favorite Canadian prospects to boost Charles Orday. I mean, their fight was absolutely phenomenal. They fought to a draw. I thought that Charles Orday actually had some some opportunities to win that fight. But, you know, that first round, man, Kali Bao, I think he shocked everybody, including Charles Orday. Like, the accuracy, accuracy was there in the striking. I I was very impressed with what he was able to do say for the first half of the fight if not the first two rounds but i think he kind of gassed a little bit was slowing down uh and in that sense right he he's he's very much a a ufc prospect in, in the grand scheme of things putting on those kinds of fights against the guy like charge old Dang, who's already seeing you know guys like andre feely on his record but you know at the end of the day i think whenever we get to see him you know come back i think it's going to be a bit more towards his uh his you know level of fighting that he's at in the ufc right now because i think that taking on jalen turner and charles Rodin is kind of a, a good understanding of where you're at in your ufc career and the fact that he's going to be getting another shot against a guy like yilan shah in his who's making a ufc debut i think that lines up a bit more with where we want to see him kind of showcase his skills i think that the first two rounds against charles Rodin were phenomenal and and i think that's where he's going to want to carry some of that momentum into his next fight and I, I like the striking you know i think that it's something that you have to give him a lot of credit for because against like i said man 
I think Turner has a lot of power for that division. But in, in the Jordan fight, I think he was able to land when he needed to. Uh, Charles Jordan is more of like that volume push forward, likes to throw his kicks. But I don't think he had a lot of the ability to you know get his timing right and, and fire off early in the fight because Kalibau was just bringing pressure. He was landing good shots, especially with his hands. So I'm looking forward to his next fight at one and one in the UFC. You know, seven and zero before getting there. Uh, or sorry, you know, technically that's a draw. So he would have been eight and one. Now he's got the old one and one record in the UFC, and I think that he's in a good position right now to to take in that experience and push forward and and take on another you know Chinese uh, prospect who's going to be coming in with a lot riding on him. And obviously, we've seen what, what happened on uh, you know the Usman Masvidal pay per view. So. Take that with a grain of salt. I think Kali Bao has an opportunity to really write the ship in his UFC career and hopefully he can go that one, one, one. <laughs> All right, number eight. This is a guy that I actually had the pleasure of watching fight live and, and Michael Trezano. And, you know, I'll never forget that card as my bachelor party, the Friday uh, card before the main event between Stipe and Cormier. You know, Israel Adesanya headlined that card. And I went into him a little bit because we've already got the videos out for uh, the fight breakdowns tonight, if you haven't seen those already. But, you know, the thing about him that I, I do like is that he's, he's a very good counter striker. You see the kickboxing, it, 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 the skill is there. I think that when, when he's able to see the shots coming his way, he's able to counter them pretty well. I think that he is going to have his hands full. You know, coming out of Tiger Shulman, I think that they have the ability to, you know, prep their fighters and strikers very, very well. But Ludovic Klein is, is on a completely different level, and I'm not going to get into him too much because we are going to be talking about him uh, later on this top 10. But, you know, you look at the, the, the losses that he has, and it's just the, via, the submission loss, right, in the second round. And, and I think that's a very respectable loss. And I think that if he's able to stay technical and, and stay disciplined in, in the fight against Ludovic, he has the opportunity to win. And I don't think people are going to give him a lot of opportunity there or credit to, to come away with a dub. But, you know, the thing about Ludovic is he he really does like to push forward. He does like to throw power shots. And I think a guy like Trezano, who should be able to take some good blows, I think he's been in some serious you know, fights in his life. And I think in this case, the stand-up, Something is something he's used to. It's not like he's going to be forced to go to the ground and have to grapple for five rounds and that kind of thing. You know, I think it's something that he's comfortable with. And so, if he's able to keep the distance, if he's able to stay disciplined, if you look at the way some of the you know previous fighters will fight, fought Klein, you know, had their fights go. I think he's able to avoid some of those mistakes, and I'm excited for it because he's going to come in as a big underdog. And if he's able to pull it off, I think that nine and one record with a guy like Ludovic under the belt is going to speak volumes about where his career can go. And you know, I, I think the counter striking is the number one play in terms of offense you know defense is going to be massive in that fight but you know just just stick to that counter striking use your kickboxing and, and, and you know in terms of experience i think he's got it he just has to you know put it all together and hope that he can come up with the big dub all right this is a guy we've not seen so much of but tucker lutz coming in at number seven he's got an 11-1 record hasn't lost since his pro debut in 2015 and what i really like about him is is just the the body of work shows how good he's in all areas right like he's got a gas tank for days he's able to work in the clinch very well he kind of does that whole boxing thing very much right throws comes in with combos and then kind of goes for the big bear hug and, and you know i think that where you see how good he is in terms of you know he was landing big big knockouts before he kind of came onto the big scene back to back dana white contender series wins you know he's doing all the right things especially at an 11 one fighter to, to to kind of get to that big stage and i think in this fight you're gonna see something that you know we're kind of used to he reminds me a little bit of jimmy rivera right Who, who's been able to just utilize that thick body come in big strikes and you know hopefully there's a bit more of an all-around game because we don't see jimmy take it to the ground at all another you know big time striker and i think that in this case you're going to see a little bit more of that clinch for a ground and pound and if he's able to execute those kinds of things i, I like this um coming month for him you know and Coming off of something like back-to-back -back Dana White Contender Series wins, he's now going to get a guy like Kevin Aguilar. Now, Kevin Aguilar is, is definitely on the hot seat, right? We've got three losses in a row to guys like Dan Ige, Charlie Rosa, and Tukugov. So, for me, I'm thinking like Aguilar on the hot seat coming in probably, you know, very serious for his fight on that uh, pay-per-view card. And I think that if... if, if Tucker Lutz wants to make a statement. That's the perfect fight, to be quite honest. I think that that's an opportunity where he could potentially send a guy, 
you know, out of the UFC, if he takes another, you know, loss four in a row, that's a rare case, right? To be able to stick around after that. So, you know, I think if he takes his fight as seriously as he should, you know, it's it's not going to be a tough fight for him to win. I, I think that he has all the skills right now to be able to do that. And see, the one thing that I absolutely love about his upcoming fight against Kevin Aguilar is that he's in a position to really showcase what he can do against the guy who's going to be bringing his best, you know, Kevin Aguilar, unfortunately, is riding a, a three-fight losing streak against big names like Charlie Rosa, Tukagov, Dan Ige. So like, those are big losses. And I think, you know, having that opportunity to fight a fourth time, he's, he's not going to be taking that lightly. And it's very rare that a fighter gets to stick around after taking four straight losses in the UFC. So, you know, very much on the hot seat, very much job on the line and, and with that promotion. And so I, I really believe that if Tucker Lutz comes in there, utilizes what he's really good at. I mean, the guy hasn't been knocked out since his debut in 2015. And he, he just hasn't lost since, right? So for me, it's like do all the right things, keep that body of work going. I think that there might be more of a, a length situation, but you know, these guys who, who come in, packed body, ready to throw in, they don't seem afraid to just get by those kicks and punches and play their game because the one thing I can say is if this fight gets kind of in the close boxing range and clinch work, it just looks like Tucker Lutz is very comfortable in that area, regardless of who he's taking on. And I think that you know, they're not throwing him to the dogs in some ways with, with really, really high, high caliber opponents, kind of like we just talked about Kali Bao and what he's had to take on in the first two fights in the UFC. So I think this is a great fight for Tucker. I think that he has the opportunity right now to put a huge nail in the coffin for um, Kevin Aguilar's career. Not that that's something you want to do, but it's something that the company will take notice of, you know, especially if it's a great performance. And, you know, it business is business. And I think that if Tucker Lutz it is going to be the same fighter we've seen over the last little bit. We could be looking at a huge, you know, maybe he jumps in the rankings per se, but you know, I, I'm really excited to see him get it on. And again, haven't seen him knock anyone out, but he could start now in the UFC. And I think that's exactly what they want. <laughs> You know, and when we talk about some of the other guys in this list, I mean, let's get right into number six, right? Mike Grundy. Not going to be your your big time knockout artist, but a few of the things that I love about him is if you think, you know, we just talked about how some guys are thrown to the wolves. I mean, a Mavzar Evloev fight um, as a up and coming UFC fighter is a massive deal. I think Mavzar Evloev is one of the most flying under the radar type of fighters that maybe what we still consider casual fans might not know about, but he's definitely talked about amongst, say, like MMA pundits, media you know, hardcore fans, he has that hype. And so for Grunny to go into that fight, be able to try and, you know, keep that distance and stay disciplined until he can get the fight to the ground and work something in. But to be honest, of Lowe's boxing and his wrestling is just so good. And I think that he he's going to be a problem for a lot of fighters. Now, going into Mike Grundy a little bit in terms of, you know, where he comes from, Getting into camp with guys like, you know, Darren Till, Tom Aspinall, like, these are the wonderful up and coming UFC fighters that he gets to be a part of. And I think when you look at Darren Till, who's leading all of these guys in a wonderful way out of that team kebab, I, I just, I'm really, really excited for them. I think that uh, Grundy brings one of those elite jujitsu games to, to the UFC, but at the same time, you can see the improvement in striking. I think that the one in one UFC record is very, um, you know, skewed with, with a loss to Mavzar Vlov, who is very, much a top 10 fighter in the UFC uh, in terms of his division, of course. And, and he gets Lando Venata next. And I think Lando is the type of guy where he might not have those elite skills that Mavzar Vlov comes with, but he's very much a creative striker. I think he might even be more creative, obviously, than Mavzar Vlov. Throws a lot of good, crazy kicks. And I think that in the past fights we've seen, you know, he's just such a gamer. He's able to take good damage. He comes back pretty strong. But at the same time, it's kind of Grundy's fight to lose in the sense that being able to stand with a guy like Evloev, you know, staying disciplined, keeping the distance, avoiding any big crazy kicks, and also with your movement, right? Lando Venata is very good at timing things. So if you're moving in one direction, Venata is constantly going to be looking for these spinning kicks and jumping knees and stuff like that to be able to time that knockout. And in this case, I would say, keeping that in your in the back of your mind as you look for the opportunity to get your takedowns in you know working that clinch getting some good dirty boxing in with a guy like lando you're cutting off a lot of his successful areas and i think that if you're able to tire him out a little bit uh, up against the fence you know you could probably get this to the ground and i think that's Gr grundy's wheelhouse you know venata i think has struggled sometimes with, with that area but he's able to get back to his feet a lot it's still going to be a very tough fight for him if it does go to the ground but i think that's definitely an area where grundy can excel and, and you, again you know you take about this the improving striking and the takedown stuff like that it's where he has a lot of success in the past and i think that with fights like venata uh moving forward 
he has the opportunity to kind of exploit that and kind of showcase his, his Brazilian jiu-jitsu skills because against a guy like Evlov, he really didn't have the opportunity. Whereas in this fight, I think he's going to be able to really take on a bit more of a demanding role, push his pace, get his game plan going, and kind of see where it goes. I'm excited for him. And that takes us into the top five, right? Tafan and Chukwi. So again, if you wanted to get into more detail about his fight against Park, feel free to check out the videos that have been released for the upcoming fights tonight. Going to be an exciting day. But um, right, Tafan and Chukwi, only 5-0, and but he he did all the right things. Dana White Contender Series win. And the one thing about the Jamie Pickett fight that I absolutely loved was, even though he comes in as this big, husky, you know, guy that we're used to seeing maybe tire out, he had opportunities to finish that fight on a regular basis. He had power carry over into the second and third rounds. The big thing for me was, you know, he did implement a really good ground and pound, but you know, it was it was curious to see why he didn't really consider a submission, things like that. I think Pickett was very much, you know, turtling up. He was recovering very well from some of the big shots, but there was a moment where it was just constant ground and pound. And obviously with Nchukwe being as powerful as he is and throwing that many strikes, like they were obviously slowing down, the power was diminishing. And it was just really interesting for him for him to have such good back position against the fence and not really maybe slip in a leg to get a hook in and kind of work in some jujitsu because, you know, if he had maybe higher level BJJ, I think he could have finished that fight even via submission if he wasn't getting the strikes down. So little things like that with a 5-0 and fighter coming to the UFC, you want to be aware of it. A guy like Park who's showcased his, his ground game, you know, he, he has never been finished via strikes and Anthony Hernandez, you know, got in a really sneaky anaconda choke. If you haven't watched that fight, that's a really cool one. I mean, Anthony Hernandez is just taking good BJJ guys out one by one, but I think that's a great opportunity, a learning opportunity for, for Park to come into this fight because, again, if I'm Park, I'm looking at Nchukwe and thinking to myself, like, yep, he's powerful. Let's tire him out. Let's keep him against the fence. Let's work it to the ground. If he's able to get up right away, that's cool. He's probably going to be more of that power type of guy to get out of his, his you know, his defense is going to be primarily power related as opposed to technique. And maybe Park can exploit that. He's improved on wrestling, especially for this level. And I think we're seeing that from, from a lot of the Asian, Korean um, and, and Chinese fighters overall. They come in with good striking, but it's obvious that they need to make that MMA game happen. And with Park, I think this could be one where if, if Ch and Chukwe is you know, seen as such a big favor, especially with Dana White contender series playing such a big part with hype sometimes, I think this is a fight where you can surprise people for sure. Uh, and that's where I think Nchukwe needs to be careful, right? Work that wrestling deep defense make sure that you can't if this fight stays standing he has a wonderful opportunity to win it i think the kickboxing's there i think the timing's there and the cardio definitely stands up to what he kind of brings to the table from offensive output and so i think that if if this fight doesn't go to the ground he should have a great opportunity to win but again i think that if you're if you're really high on Nchukwi, you know you're praying that this fight kind of stays in those areas but i think the way Park is so durable, and the fact that he doesn't lose much of his cardio, say in the first couple of rounds, I think he might have the ability to tire out and Chukwi, carry this fight into the later rounds, and see, you know, take him to deep waters and see what he's really got in terms of, you know, being a true UFC fighter. And I can't wait for that. I think that's some of my favorite fights to see, you know, some of the up and comers take on guys who aren't really that well known but can give them a really, really good test. And I, and I think that's what we're going to see in, in this fight. And it's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. Number four. Okay. We just touched on his opponent, Michael Trezano, Ludovic Klein. Now, I got to be honest. Ludovic Klein is easily an option for, for top four here. But I think that when you look at the next three, especially the way we've talked about them already in previous months, and I'm kind of giving it away, but uh, Ludovic Klein is, is an elite striker. I think that he, the fact that he owns one of my most, like, I, I'm shocked by this kind of uh, stat, if you will, but he's riding a three fight win streak all via head kick knockouts. Now, sometimes you can make the claim that the skill isn't there, or sorry, the the, um, the skill of opponent isn't there, but he did it to Shane Young. Shane Young is a very good kickboxer, coming out of city kickboxing, trades with guys like Brad Riddell, Kaikar France, Israel Asanya. You know, these are all good kickboxers, and I think that in that fight, not taking anything away from Shane, because I think that that was just a perfectly landed kick. It seems like he sets up that power kick with his left so well. And it's just something that people are having trouble reading. And, you know, three fights in a row, he's been able to land it. Now, if I'm, you know, Mike Trezano, I'm kind of telling myself, well, hey, I'm a pretty good kickboxer myself. I'm pretty defensive. I think I'm going to you know, watch out for that pretty easily. But again, you know, anything can happen. Hands go down, timing is there, bing, bang, boom. And so, you know, it's exciting to see a guy with a 72 record, be able to prove it on this stage so quickly. That's probably why he's getting such good fanfare right now. I think a lot of the hardcore fans are falling in love with him pretty quickly. He's exciting. He's built like a 
you know, maybe not a Ford truck, but maybe like a, you know, Ford Escape or something like that, a little bit smaller. But he, he's definitely built well for the division. And I think the power that he packs helps him, you know, even if he doesn't finish it on the feet, he gets on the ground, he's able to keep ground position, he's able to ground and pound, and his submissions are tight. And I think that his all around game just comes from a really good place of athleticism meets power. And when you're in the smaller weight classes, I think that does a really, really, you know, good job in terms of, you know, giving an advantage. And like I said, if, if he has to get, frustrated by getting pot shotted from the outside by Mike Trezano. That's Mike Trezano's game. And I think that that's something that he has to look out for and be aggressive, keep playing his game. Because if he allows the time to slip by with trying to land while Mike Trezano is kind of feeding him those pot shot type jabs coming with, you know, check hooks, things like that. I, I, I would be very, very, um, you know, careful for that one to go a certain way. But, you know, he's coming in as one of the biggest uh, favorites on this you know on the fights tonight and i think that's going to be something that everyone's looking for right i think he's he's one of the guys that everybody's talking about and if he comes away with another big head kick i mean let's be real four head kicks in a row riding a four fight win streak dana white and the boys are going to do everything everything they can with that you know hasn't lost since 2017 and he's eight no overall oh, eight no overall so I, I i can't say enough about the guy i think that if you go look at the tape you can just see how good he is and Again, I'm pretty much talking about him like he's, you know, a top three, top two prospect anyway on this list, but he, he really is. And I think the next four guys are really interchangeable and it's the fight game, right? Anything can happen in the octagon. And I think that's where we're going to see the difference between all these guys come into play. Now, with that said, at numbers two and three, we've got guys taking on each other again. And then that's Phil Hawes and Kyle Dock is Phil Hawes. We're going to put him at number three at the 10 and two record. And Kyle Dock's we're going to put him at number two with the 10 and one record. So Kyle Dock is obviously, you know, pretty high on my list last month. I'm wearing the, you know, Pittsburgh Pirates hat for a reason here. Pennsylvania, I'm repping that hard. I mean, I don't think I've talked about another fighter so much. So like I said, I got to wear it proudly. I try to be as unbiased as I possibly can. But Kyle Docks has been on my radar for a very, very long time. I think there's literally 10 minute videos, at least three of them across my channel, where you can see how much I talk about this man. But again, the Docus brothers, Philly. I love boxing. I grew up on boxing. Chris Dawkins, what a great boxer, right? So now I'm coming into Kyle. And, and when I watch that Brandon Allen fight, I've watched it three times now. It's just such a great fight. I think I put it in my top three, top five fights coming out of 2020. And the reason why I can't get over how good this kid is is because of his his lack of even caring who he fights. He's He, he should have fought Kizri if that fell through. Now he's taking on Phil Hawes, who's riding such a huge hype train, right? And so, you know, when we talk about Phil, it's it's... This is where I put him at number three. You know, I talked about in, in their fight matchup. Go check out the video if you want to see more of a comparison of them in terms of styles. But Phil Haas had an interesting come up, right? It was very much a hardworking, you know, blue collar. Like, I'm going to get my opportunity when it comes and I'm going to keep going and pushing forward till I do. Three Dana White Contender Series performances ends up finally getting that big finish that he needed. Now, he goes into a, a USC debut, which should have been a bit more challenging for him. Now, not taking anything away from Jacob Malkoon, who's a good boxer, but... The guy weighed in as a replacement fighter on the Robert Whitaker, Jared Cannonier card. He's a training partner of Robert Whitaker's and he just ends up getting the Phil Hawes fight. Now he loses the fight in less than 20 seconds via knockout. So it's just, you know, Phil Hawes was built on that. And then he ends up fighting Imavov who he doesn't actually have a good striking advantage with and uses the wrestling and clinch work, things like that to be able to sneakily get that win. Now, that's the thing with Phil Haas that I'm still trying to figure out. It's like, how good is the striking against guys that know how to strike? Imavov came in as a great French kickboxer. We've seen a lot of these guys find success in the UFC, at least when it comes to striking. And Cyril Gann is like your primo, primo, tip-top shape kind of guy when it comes to that whole realm. But that's where I think Phil Haas, you know, he was exposed a little bit when it came to the striking. And... I think Kyle Dawkins has that advantage. The most amazing stat for Kyle Dawkins is in all of those big time fights, 94% takedown defense. I mean, that is a big deal. He's not taking on schlumps, you know, he's taking on some big deal fighters and guys like Brendan Allen. And I, and I really, really was impressed with the Stolfus fight. And I think that's what sold me to just keep dick riding this hard. I, I, uh, <laughs> but I think that that's the most fun part about his game, right? The guy's an exciting fighter. I think he's got skills in every area. And when his brother is punching like that at heavyweight you can only imagine what Kyle Dawkins will look like full camp ready to go knows his opponent for quite some time I think that this is going to be the best Kyle Dawkins we see and I, I mean I'm probably pretty excited about it if you can't tell now for Phil Hawes you know what I mean I love the blonde hair I love everything he's bringing you know excitement confidence I think that's where he needs to keep his mindset because when he's in that level of mentality I think he's absolutely you know 
borderline flawless. I think that Jacob Malcoon fight, we saw timing. We saw, you know, patience. Things like that are what's going to help him win this fight. Kyle Dawkins is going to be the guy that can go three rounds, no problem. Kyle Dawkins is the guy that can take damage. You want to wrestle him? Good luck. He's just so big and thick, right? And I think even in the weigh you just saw how, how much of a size difference there kind of is between these two. And I think that when it comes to like that bone structure and true height, like you can be as thick as you want, but you know, Kyle Dawkins does look like the bigger man. And I think getting in there, trying to leap in throw big shots is going to be what Phil Haas needs to do. Now that's where I'm just, you know, kind of curious if Imavov was able to deal with that striking and kind of have to deal more so with the grappling and, and the crip and the, and the uh, uh, clinch work. I, I really think that, Kyle Dawkins in this fight deserves a bit of an edge. And that's where I think that, you know, for me, he comes in at number two. I think Phil Haas has a lot of hype coming in with him. I think that the knockouts always play a bit more uh, volume when it comes to just, you know, gauging how good of a fighter is. And again, the Mavov fight was the most impressive for me. He was able to kind of, you know, figure out what his game plan should be on the fly, gave up on the striking, went hard at the wrestling and the grappling. And I thought that was just a, a, such a smart move. Now in this fight, he's going to have to see which which way it goes. And I got to be honest, I think the standing and banging might make a bit more sense with a guy who's going to be athletic. He's going to be able to get out of certain situations. And I think keeping the energy, don't get too tired and just try to find those big shots as you get in there, leap in, change levels, that kind of stuff. That's that. It's going to be a tough belt, but I think that Phil Hawes it, it, and, and you know, Kyle Dawkins could end up fighting to the fight of the night type of type of fight. So, you know, obviously I'm hella excited for it. I think you guys should be too. Those are numbers three and two prospects with Phil Haas coming at three and Kyle Dawkins coming at number two. And, you know, obviously that fight's going to dictate where their, their careers go and where this list lies with their, uh, you know, two and three ranking. But with that said, who's number one? Demir is Magulov. I mean, a lot of people will say a 22 and one with a three no ufc record you aren't really a prospect and i kind of see that right but that's why i'm giving him the definitive number one i just want to give the guy a bunch of clout right i think he's so good and if you think about where he left off at before that year off in 2020 i mean the guy went three and oh he took on tiago moises who we saw have an amazing 2020 going into some big fights and now looking like a, a primo you know contender in the ufc he beat him last in 2019, took a year off. You know, now he takes on Rafael Alves, a guy who he was supposed to fight, you know, next week, but now it's going to be on the 22nd of May. And, you know, I think this is going to be an absolutely phenomenal fight. The problem with um, our friend Alves is he's had a bunch of canceled bouts. You know, he had an impressive performance on the Contender Series, and then he kind of just, you know, three straight fights have been canceled for obvious reasons, you know, within health and, and all these kinds of things with him. But... I also think that in, in, in this fight, it's going to be, you know, a huge increase in terms of competitiveness. I think that Demir Magilov, you know, he's not sitting around eating potato chips, as they say, right? I, I think that this man has definitely been working Tiger Shulman time. You know, I, I think that he's he's very, very ready for, for the big time in the UFC. He's kind of reminds you of those, um, you know, Mavzar Vloevs who have all the skill in the world, have the right following from the right people, but needs that, you know, mainstream push. And that's why I'm putting him at number one. I actually requested Jeremy to let me do it because I think that this is one fighter that because we haven't seen him in a year, there is that intangible factor of, you know, is he going to have rust after that long of a layoff, you know, still 22 and one three on the UFC, but I really like what he brings to the table from a skill perspective. I think the Rafael Alves fight is going to be an absolute barn burner. You know, we got a good jujitsu guy going up against, you know, classic Russian with the good strike and going to bring some good wrestling. And I think that, in this case, it's going to be a tough fight for Alves. I think that of all the fights that he could have been taking, this is going to be the one that, you know, at least it's a oh, one and done. If he gets away with the win, I mean, that's a big time win over Demir Magilov. But again, I really like what this man brings to the table. And you look at the things he's accomplished already, you know, at that age, it's just, you know, it's the, he's in the perfect time to kind of take the UFC by storm. And, you know, I think it was up to us to kind of give him a bit of bump here. So, you know, if you have any disagreements with the, with the list, feel free to let us know in the comments. I think that, you know, of all the lists we've done, this is the one I'm kind of excited just to see, you know, the Phil Hawes, Kyle Dawkins uh, matchup and is Magalov fighting in two weeks. Like these are all fighters that we can get really, really excited about. And you go to the bottom of the list, you know, Danielle Wolf, unfortunately we lost, but Kali Bao, you know, we're going to have, you know, again, Trezano and Ludovic Klein taking it on, uh, getting it on this tonight, actually. And so that's, that's the fun stuff with doing these prospect watch. It's probably my favorite part about doing all this content. So if you're enjoying it, subscribe, hit that like button, show me that bell, get some notifications. And yeah, we'll check you back next next month with the next prospect watch peace